Hey, this is Otomaton, aka J, from Kazoku no Takus, and today we're bringing you a quality video about our usual topic of choice. Anime, of course. Today, however, will be something new and different. As I'm sure many of you likely know, No Game No Life Zero will be releasing July 15th of 2017. And in order to prepare you for the epic awesomeness that will be Zero, I felt we needed to bridge the gap. Sadly, the events taking place in the anime only cover up to the epilogue of Volume 3 of the Light Novel, but Zero is actually based on Volume 6. Now if you haven't read the novels, no worries, we got you covered, and that's what this video is all about. Warning, this video is literally pure spoilers for the Light Novels. So if you plan to binge the Allens before the release, you may want to tune away now. But if not, well, you're in luck, because we're going to cover most of the events leading up to the film for you, right here, right now. So without further ado, let's get started with Volume 1. So just to start, for those of you who've seen the anime, the events of the first three light novels are pretty much covered in the first season. So make sure to jump ahead to the Volume 4 section for the bridging, since you've basically seen everything in the first three. Still here? Good. Then let's go one day. Let's go ahead and go again. Our starts with two Hikikomori shut-in siblings in the middle of an online game. The pair comprise the gaming duo Blank, an undefeated game master known far and wide throughout the gaming community as an urban legend. One day, the undefeated duo receive a challenge from someone named Tet to play him at a game of chess and the duo successfully defeats him, which prompts Tet to invite the pair to a new world, one which revolves around the games they love so much. Sora and Shiro accept, of course, believing it to be a joke initially, until they are summoned to the world of Disboard, that is. In Disboard, everything is held together by a spell called the Ten Pledges, which basically prevents violence while enforcing the rules and outcomes of the games. The duo travel to Elkia, a nation of humans, and befriend... well, sort of, anyways. Be befriend Stephanie Dola, who happens to be the granddaughter of the now-deceased former king of Elkia. After finding out the nation is in a steady decline, Sora and Shiro decide to participate in the contest to decide Elkia's next ruler. The two challenge the frontrunner and almost assured victor, Kurami Zell, to a game, and ultimately Blank comes out victorious, becoming the crowned rulers of Elkia. Book 1 ends with Sora making a public declaration that his intentions are to conquer the other nations and make Elkia flourish. Tet then shows up again and congratulates the duo, leaving them with the goal of collecting all 16 race pieces to challenge him once again. This brings us to book number two. Now, book two introduces the Werebeasts and the Eastern Federation, but before we get to that, the duo actually have to challenge a flugel named Jabril for information, and Sora, Shiro, and Jabril face off in a game of Shiri Tori, where their spoken objects will either materialize or disappear. What's there will disappear. What's not there will appear. The game comes to a close when Blank induce a hypernova by removing Column's law, making Jabril unable to continue. Following the decisive match, Jabril becomes Blank's slave, but unfortunately the information from both the library and Jabril herself turns out to be of no help at all. At a loss for what to do next, Stephanie discloses her grandfather's will to Sora, which leads the group to discover a hidden library in the castle containing her grandfather's research. Realizing the Eastern Federation are actually using video games, Sora and Shiro formalize their challenge by betting everything humanity owns, including their race piece. As the duo await the challenge date to approach, Sora tells Shiro that soon the missing piece to their victory will arrive. The next day, Shiro awakens to discover that everyone has forgotten about Sora, and so ends Volume 2. With us so far? Great. Then onward to Volume 3, the final of the volumes covered in the anime. Having forgotten Sora, Shiro starts to doubt that he was ever actually real in the first place, but by asking about the date, Shiro manages to figure out that she, Stephanie, and Jabril have a gap missing in their memories. Pushing herself really hard, she manages to recover a memory of Sora challenging Kurumi and Phil Nilval into a game of reversi, using the components making up each of their identities as the pieces. Sora, by the end of the game, only had three remaining pieces, each of which was Shiro's memories of him, allowing her to resume the game and win on his behalf. Having seen each other's memories and being allowed to keep a copy of them, Sora manages to convince Kurumi and Phil to ally themselves with humanity and his cause. 
Finally, with all the pieces in place, the game against the Werebeast in the Eastern Federation begins. Sora, Shiro, Stephanie, and Jabril all enter a virtual shooting game in a fake recreation of Tokyo against Izunu Hatsuse, where after a close match they manage to snag a victory due to Blank's ability to think three moves ahead of their opponent at all times. Well, or at least Shiro's. Just watch it, or read, you'll see what I'm saying. As a result of their win, the Kingdom of Elkia gains a large mass of land and rights to all of the werebeasts occupying them. Sora and Shiro use political pressure to force the leader of the Eastern Federation, the mysterious Miko, to challenge them. The game is a coin flip where Sora manages to arrange to have the coin land on its edge. He then convinces Miko to declare that they both win and, as a result, Elkia can share resources with the Eastern Federation while the werebeasts maintain their self-rule. From this newly minted union, the new colony known as the Elkia Federation is born. And that wraps the gist of not only the anime series, but also of Volume 3 of the Light Novel. The game has changed from here on, ladies and gents, and what you're about to hear from here on out is all new material. There is one exception, however, but we'll cross that bridge after the next two novels. So, without further delay, let's progress on to Volume 4. Volume 4 picks up when a Dampyr named Plum visits Sora and Shiro and asks them to save the Dampyr species. Plum explains the Siren's Empress, Layla Lorelli, put herself to sleep using the Ten Pledges centuries ago, and as a result, the once mutualistic relationship between Dampyrs and Sirens has caused all but one male Dampyr to die. To awaken the Empress, they must enter her dream and win her love. After consulting with the Miko, Blank and companions travel to the Dampier and Siren country, Oshiendo, and enter the Empress's dream. Using Plum's magic, the Empress falls in love with Eno but fails to actually wake up. Since he failed, Eno is turned into stone. Having deduced this to be one of the possibilities, Sora uses a loophole in the rules, allowing him and his companions to leave mid-game. Sora and Shiro reveal that the Sirens do not actually know the true way to awaken the Empress, so the group decides to split up to figure out what it is. Sora, Shiro, Jabril, and Plum go to Avinheim, home of the Flugels, while Stephanie and Izuna search the previous King's Hidden Library for answers. Thus ends Volume 4. Moving right along, Volume 5's prologue starts off showing Karami and Phil's progression in their efforts to overthrow the Elven Nation which they're working on with Sora and company to complete. From there, it then picks up where Volume 4 left off, with Sora and company being overwhelmed by Avon Haim's library. They decide to challenge all of the Flugels to a game to enlist their help. The goal of the game is for Sora and Shiro to avoid capture by using Plum's Vite magic and various Katakana characters to materialize whatever they desire. Eluding capture, the duo convince the head Flugel Asriel to have Avon Haim join the Elkia Federation. After winning, Avin Haim's library proves to be completely fruitless, but Shiro deduces what the Empress desires nonetheless. At the same time, Stephanie and Izuna find evidence to support Shiro's theory. Returning to the Empress's dream, Sora's immunity to the Empress's seduction fulfills her La Douleur Exquise desire and awakens her. This also reverts Eno from stone back to life. Their victory gives them rule over the Siren and Dampyr, also adding them to the Elkia Alliance's ranks. That night, Plum reveals humanity also acquired the Siren's role as food for the Dampiers in attempts to feed on Sora and Shiro. But, due to plot armor, the two had already deduced Plum's intentions and had returned responsibility back to the Sirens. And that, ladies and gentlemen, leads us into Volume 6 of the Light Novel, aka the source material for this upcoming film. Now, this is where that exception that I mentioned earlier comes in though. So, skipping right past the events of Book 6 for the most part, I'll give a basic setup of Book 6 and discuss the ending a little. But, don't worry, the book's ending shouldn't have anything to do with the film, so no biggie. Rather, this will actually be a spoiler to people reading the light novel who haven't seen the show itself. So, if you're one of those people, now is your chance to tune away. Okay. Still here? Cool. So, setting up book 6, the story actually revolves around 18-year-old Riku Dola, his sister Kurone Dola, and an ex machina named Shuvi. It's worth mentioning that the story itself actually takes place before the 10 pledges that rule the series up to this point were in place, and it's actually the tale of how Tet managed to become God, as told to Izuna by Tet himself. Like I said, 
I won't go into too much details here, since you can read the novel in August when it releases in the US, or, if you'd rather, you can watch the actual film itself when it releases tomorrow. But one important thing to mention is the event that occurs at the end of Light Novel 6, and also as a twist at the end of Season 1 of No Game No Life. After the events tech details, we return to the present day where Sora and company request that the Miko summon her old dais for a game, which she agrees to, and the duo then challenge the old dais to a game, as seen in my little window here. This is important, as going forward, if the series manages to score another season, one of two things is possible. They can overlook the ending to the series and start from the Miko's point up, which is likely the most logical of the choices, or number two, they can challenge the old dais at that point and rearrange the order. Though, given the event of the two volume spanning fight against the old dais, it's doubtful the latter would actually happen. It's certainly not out of the question, but logically it makes more sense to have it start from the events of Volume 3's epilogue and then work its way back to that point. To be honest, I assume if they were to do another series of the anime, then it would be likely that a 12 episode run would cover the events of Volumes 4, 5, and possibly 7 being in there as well. The much more likely option is that a second season may even only cover 4 and 5 since there's so much going on in those two volumes, which would put an additional season at going into books 7, 8, and 9, which are the old Deus and Ex Machina arcs respectively. For those also not in the know, it was also recently announced that Volume 10 will be releasing on July 25th of 2017, so you really could almost say that this month is officially No Game No Life Month. In any case, thank you for bearing with me on this journey. I hope you've learned a lot about the series, and I hope you're as excited about this awesomeness as I am. I've been personally beyond ecstatic to see No Game No Life return. As one of my favorite series of all time in the light novel department, a gorgeously styled anime that sets it apart from others in the same genre, and with its unique story approach that outlaws violence, it quickly became one of my favorites, and any and all movement on seeing my favorite moments from the novels adapted is pure joy to me. I can't wait to see No Game No Life make its return, and you can see it too starting tomorrow, July 15th, when it officially releases. And if you're craving more of my heavenly silky voice, you can catch me on the review of No Game No Life Zero on our channel very soon. Subscribe and be the first to know when the video is out. That's all for everything you need to know, a new addition to the Kazoku no Otaku's original series library, and I will catch you on the next video. This is Otamaton from Kazoku no Otakus, reminding you that if you get bored of your world, you can always feel free to leave and join ours. Thanks for watching. Peace!